Hi, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Um, thanks for joining. I'm going to give it just a couple of seconds uh, to let people join the webinar from the waiting room. Thanks so much for joining us this morning. Um, so just to start out, um, this uh, I'm, I'm very pleased to, to be hosting this webinar for IPA on behalf of the Financial Inclusion Program and our Social Protection Program this morning. Um, the presentation today is Poverty Traps and Microenterprises and How to Catalyze Asset Accumulation for Entrepreneurs. Um, I'm, I'm really happy to have this, this group of speakers with us today as an opportunity to, I'm going to say, revisit the role of asset accumulation and microenterprise growth as an anti-poverty strategy. Um, I think we're all at this point familiar with the first generation of microfinance studies, including work produced by IPA. Um, which failed to find transform, transformational effects on key outcomes such as profit and income um, from microcredit, more, more traditional forms of microcredit uh, as an anti-poverty strategy. However, we know that these results were subject to a significant amount of variation across geography, um, the design of programs and products, um, and the beneficiaries themselves. So um, this convening this morning is an opportunity to, <clears throat> to revisit these um, I guess these findings and these challenges uh, and present work from three new studies which explore these nuances. Um, so what does it mean um, to have variation across the types of beneficiaries? How do we segment users? Um, you know, who does it work for and who does it not work for? And how do we better target those who will have successful outcomes um, from these types of programs? And what are the nuances in product design and program delivery that we need to be paying attention to as we're designing new interventions? Um, so our presenters uh, will present three new studies, um, which discuss the first generation versus second generation of microfinance studies or research. Um, then we'll have a chance for discussion on implications for practitioners and policymakers. Um, so I'm Rebecca Ross. I'm the Director of Financial Inclusion here at, at, at Innovations for Poverty Action, or IPA. Um, I'm, I'm pleased to be joined by um, our four speakers uh, who will present work on the panel. I'm just going to briefly introduce everyone. We're joined by Mohammed Meki, Assistant Professor in the Department of International Development at University of Oxford. Dr. Simon Quinn, Associate Professor of Development of Economics in the University of Oxford. Dr. Maitri Shkatak, Professor of Economics at the London School of Economics and Political Science. And Dr. Cynthia Kinnan, James L. Paddock, Jr. Professor in International Economics at Tufts University. Um, and I'll say, you know, flag two things. I think this is also particularly well-timed because this discussion is coinciding with the release of a new VoxDev lit review on microfinance, which I hope everyone has seen and we can share um, after the webinar, but it was edited by three of our panelists. Um, so I'm excited to hear uh, how, you know, learnings from that experience as well. Um, and especially uh, excited to introduce the uh, work on um, asset-based microcredit from um, Mohammed and Simon, which was funded by IPA's Financial Services for the Poor Research Fund. And um, we're really excited to see that paper out. Um, so just some quick housekeeping before we get started. Um, there is no chat available on this format, but we do have a Q&A box. Um, each presenter is going to have time to present their paper, and we'll have a little bit of time after each individual presentation for clarification questions from the group. Please do submit your questions into the Q&A box and we'll address them during that, um, during that space. Uh, at the end of the presentations, we'll have a longer opportunity for questions and discussion. So um, we'll try to address the majority of the, the questions uh, during that period. So anything that, you, that comes up, comes to mind uh, as you're watching the presentations, please do put them in the Q&A and we'll have a chance to discuss them at the end. Um, so great. So without further ado, why don't we move to the first presentation? So this will be my Trish. Ask you to share your screen. Thank you. Good afternoon from where I am in London. Um, I'm going to talk about a paper that um, I've been working on for uh, some time with my colleagues, uh, Oriana Bandiera, Robin Burgess at the LSE, as well as our former student, Claire Balboni, who's now at MIT, and Anton Heil, who's at Berkeley. 
What this study does is essentially ask the question as to do the poor stay poor because they are stuck in low return occupations or are they in low return occupations because they start poor? So this is a very basic uh, kind of view of, uh, of poverty or in particular persistence of poverty, which is it could be that people just are dif different. So people may have differences in um, uh, skills and there may be differences in the organizations that they work in, uh, whether it's agriculture or an informal sector enterprise, et cetera, or local regional traits, which uh, has issues like access to markets, infrastructure, which keeps productivity down and that keeps people poor. That's kind of a sort of heterogeneity based view of poverty. The alternatively is a self-reinforcing uh, uh, vicious cycle kind of view of poverty, where even if uh, the underlying heterogeneity considerations are similar, uh, individuals who start very differently could end very differently because of some basic threshold effects so that unless you have a certain minimum level of assets, you do not kind of start um, uh, uh, kind of um, uh, be able to uh, develop the critical mass or the critical velocity to escape poverty. So what my colleagues did, and this paper is a follow-up on, on that, is basically they uh, looked at a large-scale uh, RCT in, in Bangladesh, in the northern part of Bangladesh. Uh, the project started in, in 2007, where basically what um, there, there was a panel data of 6,000 households over an 11-year-old uh, period. Uh, and basically what it was, was a large scale asset transfer program to rural women. And in particular, the data uh, that we analyze, and I'm gonna talk about um, some of that in um, a bit, bit of detail, essentially supports the poverty trap views that threshold effects seem to be important. That those who receive the assets, if their initial assets had some critical value, only then by having this additional injection of assets allowed them to escape poverty. Whereas for others who did not have initial assets, complementary assets uh, that they could work with, uh, with this um, you know, injection of new assets, they fell, fell uh, back to their old levels. Okay, so that's kind of the main, main um, 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 sort of uh, finding here. So um, I want to sketch a little bit of the uh, kind of uh, program here because otherwise um, uh, it would not be clear as to uh, what, what is the sort of setting and how, what, what policy implications we, do we take from that. But clearly because of the limitations of time, I will not um, uh, uh, be able to give you all the uh, kind of details that makes this quite a rich and interesting case to uh, certainly for us to analyze and, 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 and reflect on. So basically this is BRAC's uh, targeting ultra poor program, uh, which basic uh, about 21,000 households of which 6,000 are extremely poor and living in about 1300 villages. And the poorest women in randomly chosen villages um, receive an asset uh, coupled with some training. And basically it's this one-off transfer of productive assets and training, which aims to relax both credit and skill constraints and create a steady um, a flow of regular earnings for these um, uh, poor women. Uh, essentially, beneficiaries are offered to choose from uh, several uh, asset bundles. Most of them ended up choosing most by meaning more than 90% uh, asset bundle containing a cow because um, a livestock uh, dairy uh, is, is kind of the popular form of self-employment activity from the baseline survey uh, that we had. And the BRAC uh, kind of program encouraged respondents to retain the assets for at least two years, after which they are completely free to liquidate uh, or, 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 or build on to what they, what, what they have. So essentially the ultra poor households are about 6% of the population. And they were basically, they were divided in two groups, uh, control and treatment by, by the villages under the randomization and um, uh, about uh, 3,000 would, would kind of receive, the, uh, receive this assets and others would be control groups um, who, who would be studied all through this period. 
So essentially, the survey also covered some of the other non-extreme poor to have a sense of what is the productive uh, structure of these economies, what else do people do, etc. And essentially, uh, in the 4,000 out of 6,000 ultra poor beneficiaries, they were basically engaged only in casual labor at the baseline. And the asset transfer was equivalent to doubling of average baseline wealth for the ultra poor. So it was a relatively large uh, 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 injection. There were a um, couple of follow-up surveys and this continued for uh, more than a decade. And, and essentially the key findings from the original study that my co-authors, uh, Oriana Bandier and Robin Burgess did with um, other, other co-authors, basically what they find uh, out of the basic uh, structure of this economy is uh, that the poor tend to stay poor and essentially those who are poor, they are largely engaged in casual labor, which is domestic labor or uh, agricultural labor. Whereas the richer are employed in self-employment activities such as livestock rearing and land cultivation. The better jobs require productive assets, but productive assets is what really sets apart the rich and the poor uh, within these village economy contexts. And the richer households own uh, expensive and indivisible assets. Wage labor is uncertain and seasonal and pays less. And this is what uh, kind of tends to keep those who are engaged in those activities um, uh, poor. That's, that's what the over, over time picture seems to show. Now, what this program basically did, just to recap a bit, uh, essentially involved uh, giving something like a, a combination of livestock as well as asset uh, specific training that was given uh, to, to these uh, individuals. And basically what uh, the final sample that this study um, looks at is um, about 6,000 plus eligible beneficiaries and some of the others that were studied who were not extremely poor. This is a graph that gives us a sense of the shift in the asset distribution that this program kind of engineered. So essentially the red uh, curve is the treatment uh, 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 distribution of assets. Okay, uh, on the horizontal axis, we have the productive assets in log scale. This is just the standard probability density and the control group has this dash line. And what this asset transfer essentially involved was shifting um, a, a bunch of people from, uh, from this spot to this spot resulting in uh, this little bit of a blip in the treatment group and, and, and kind of this um, um, fall in the, in the um, um, presence of people in the very bottom tail of this distribution. And what this essentially uh, led to was what um, the earlier study found was it transformed the labor activity choices of the ultra poor women Four years after the transfer, they are basically working more and essentially uh, compared to what they were uh, labor hours they were putting in before. And in particular, uh, there um, is a overall positive uh, effects on the hours worked, as well as this leads to higher earnings about 21% compared to their counterparts in the, in the control villages as well as um, they, they, they consume more and the value of household durables is higher. What is most striking uh, in their finding is that now four years after the transfer, the ultra poor in treatment villages had more than four times the amount of savings and were more likely to receive and give loans to other households. And moreover, they also significantly accumulate more assets over this period. Now, this is the average effect of uh, this program. What uh, we kind of you know, then examine in this particular paper is the heterogeneity in terms of those who had initial assets and how much they're uh, behaving or what their asset accumulation looks like you know, based on differences in the initial assets. So essentially what we look at is um, if, if we do this, uh, this is what would kind of look like. So if you look at the capital accumulation pattern, and this is where we are taking the heterogeneity uh, very seriously in terms of what, ha what is happening to these individuals. If you look at the horizontal axis, what we have is the baseline productive assets after the transfer after these people have received the transfer. So what this gives is uh, the initial assets they had plus the tra transfer amount. 
And on the vertical axis, we have productive assets in 2011, which is uh, four years after uh, the initial transfer. And what we see is a capital accumulation pattern, right? That very much suggests the following, that those who were kind of below this amount, they kind of, you know, they fall below. They, they essentially, that they stay low. Whereas those who exceed this amount, they actually have higher, higher uh, levels of productive assets in, in 2011. So essentially those below a certain threshold actually decumulate and those above the uh, threshold accumulate. And we are empirically able to uh, kind of, you know, establish uh, the particular threshold uh, for this. Of course, there are many ways of estimating this. The earlier one was kind of a, a, a structure-free, non-parametric way of doing this, but we can also do it in, in, in other more structured ways. And we can also look at what happens to the control group because we could basically, we're tracking them over the same period. And uh, if you look at them, then in that case, their, um, uh, their accumulation pattern behavior does not suggest uh, any effect of a threshold effect. And of course, they did not receive this large scale injection. So I realize I don't have uh, very much time. So let me just make a few observations about what we believe are the core uh, mechanisms as to what really was going on beyond this establishing this basic property of having a threshold effect that those who had assets above a certain threshold could make use of the transfer and others kind of fell below. So what we see is that there is a discontinuity in the ownership of vehicles. That is among individuals with very similar levels of capital, those to the right of the threshold uh, seems to own more vehicles and vehicles are things that you would need uh, for the livestock dairy kind of activities that they uh, having, having uh, 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 kind of dairy uh, um, sort of uh, farming and former dairy farming would be helpful. So that clearly seemed to be an important asset differential that was driving how some people could make it, you know, take advantage of it and others uh, couldn't do that. And what's also interesting is that after the transfer of the difference between the individuals above and below the thresholds, this grows rapidly over time with the acquisition of increasingly more expensive assets, cow sheds and goats after two years and cows after four. So this is what essentially those who have above the threshold assets, that's the kind of assets they accumulate over time. So I just want to make a few remarks about um, kind of you know policy implications, and then then um, uh, have some uh, time for uh, questions. And of course, we'll have a longer Q and A uh, towards the end. So if you look at uh, what what was uh, what what kind of you know, so this would be a helpful way to think about it. So here, what we are trying to do is uh, on the horizontal axis, we are evaluating different types of transfer values. These are alternative potential type of transfers. So consider uh, these uh, individuals in the sample and their average annual per capita consumption. Suppose the asset that you're transferring to them is on average 20%, right? So that's 0.2, this is 40%, this is 60%, this is 80%, et etc. et cetera. And then using this distribution, we are asking the question that with this average transfer, how many would cross this threshold uh, that, that we identify? And we can see that if it's a relatively small amount, then only 20% would cross the threshold and go on with a positive accumulation cycle. And the larger uh, the asset amount is, the larger and larger fraction of people would be able to take advantage of this. What's interesting is we compare a whole range of program and I realize uh, it may not be easy to absorb all this very quickly, but just to give a sample, we do this, but here this red line is a micro credit uh, worth $100 in PPP terms, right? This is the same micro credit, but this is $200 in PPP terms. These are some of the other asset transfer programs that have been um, uh, kind of evaluated by uh, other uh, related studies. And this kind of basically shows that these microloan type things are only able to push a relatively smaller fraction of people uh, above the threshold, whereas the BRAC program, uh, which is about 80% of their average consumption level, was able to push uh, a much bigger fraction, about more than 60% above um, the kind of um, uh, critical threshold. 
So I want to conclude with the following interesting trade-offs, uh, which is if you have limited resources, you have to uh, have a choice as to whether you want to be, make big asset transfers that would have a kind of permanent dent in terms of pushing people above a certain threshold and keeping them above and on a positive path of accumulation. Alternatively, you can split up <laughs> a given amount of revenue among smaller chunks and give it to a wider group of people. But that's not going to help very much in terms of making a dent on persistent poverty, even though it might provide consumption relief, which has its own value. And also <clears throat> heterogeneity is important. You know, what kind of program uh, would suit uh, what kind of individuals? This is a very particular program. And we of course have to think about external validity in terms of, you know, whether we want to apply to other, other studies and so on. So this is our conclusion that poverty is basically a misallocation of human resources because it, it, it not only poverty is, 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 um, uh, is um, a serious uh, limitation in terms of human be beings, uh, in terms of their quality of life and what kind of you know, uh, uh, overall um, um, uh, sort of uh, uh, extreme vulnerability they face but it's also uh, actual loss to potential output because if you help these uh, people uh, out of uh, poverty, they actually accumulate and they actually generate uh, revenue in terms of the kind of activities they do. What we have established here is that the existence of poverty thresholds could be important and to the extent they are, we have this choice between whether we give big push kind of amounts to a smaller group of people versus small amounts to a larger um, uh, group of people. I'll stop here. Great, thank you very much. Um, and just a reminder to everyone, please do input your questions into the Q&A box. Um, we will try to answer them after each presentation. And um, if we don't get to them, we'll save them for the discussion at the end um, of, the, of the panel. Um, let me just flag one that's come in now. Um, which uh, I think we're gonna get a chance to talk about a little bit more um, down the road with, with Mohammed and, and Simon's presentation. The question is, do you have any data that, or feeling that a guess as to whether if the treatment group had to finance their asset acquisition with credit, the positive outcomes would remain? Um, I'm sure that essentially these individuals uh, where and remain credit constrained. So uh, even though after uh, receiving and accumulating assets, they are uh, ability to access loans have kind of gone up, right? But uh, the premise here is that if they had to uh, finance their asset accumulation with credit, uh, you know, they, they wouldn't be, you know, that wouldn't be happening. So let me uh, uh, phrase it a bit differently. A theory of poverty traps now essentially are based on not only having indivisibility thresholds that you only need a cow, you cannot buy a half a cow or a quarter of a cow or, or for that matter, a machine, right? That's number one. But of course, if you could borrow, then essentially that makes this more divisible that you, you kind of borrow and then you pay out of the revenue you're getting that de facto kind of makes the whole thing more liquid. So you actually need a combination of both these constraints for the problem to really kick in the poverty trap problem. So I guess that would be uh, one way to uh, uh, approach your question. It's a good one, thanks. Um, just another question quickly. Um, could you clarify again what the dollar value was for the BRAC transfer, which you referred to as 80% of typical consumption levels? Um, <clears throat> excuse me, and is that compared to consumption per month or per year? Right. So uh, in terms of um, uh, the actual dollar value, this is 2007 US dollars, um, you know, Bangladeshi Taka converted into US dollar PPP terms, $560 is the sum in 2007 dollars. Okay. Um, another question, can you highlight the other supports from BRAC like business counseling, et cetera, that, that are provided in addition to the asset transfer? Um, in some other studies, these counseling services were said to be important. So how do those interact with the asset transfer? It's a great question. And indeed, you're right that in this particular um, uh, program, they were bundled. And therefore, whatever we find, it's a combination of this training and, and a certain amount of, you know, assistance uh, after this 
you know, as as we, uh, you know, um, uh, you know, as we one can imagine, that suddenly you have a cow uh, in front of your door. So presumably, if you do not have any any practice or any training before, there would be a learning phase. And clearly, BRAC was very focused on providing this assistance. In an ideal world, we would want to sort of, you know, uh, try to see that whether you give them just a certain financial amount and they can buy whatever asset they want versus the training versus the combination, et cetera. But just to, again, specifically answer this program that we uh, based this paper on, it was a bundle uh, training come uh, asset transfer program. Um, another question, uh, can you say more about how you determine the poverty thresholds? Right. So essentially, uh, this comes from um, a kind of a theoretical framework of establishing kind of poverty uh, traps, where the idea is, see, empirically, if you if you if you if you look at that, everybody says getting just to give a, uh, you know, a hypothetical example, suppose all of us are getting say 1000 pounds or, uh, you know, to, you know, so then you track people and then you empirically try to see uh, if you track people over time, what is the total amount above which on average people are kind of on a positive cycle. So uh, one, just to, uh, you know, give a, give a physical analogy that, that I find helpful to think about. Suppose you are, um, you are doing something that uh, kids, maybe a, a little misguided kids um, in playgrounds often try to do, that you have a slide which you're supposed to you know, go from uh, top to bottom, right? That's what, how slides work in playgrounds. But suppose you're trying to run up to the slide from the other end, yeah? Suppose you're trying to do that. You basically need a certain threshold you know, velocity to be able to sort of cross and go up to the very top, otherwise, if you try it, and, and uh, there should be appropriate safety warning here, if you actually were to do that, uh, you will fall below. You try to, you know, you casually try to walk up that, you will kind of fall below. So essentially what we are doing is if we translate this now in, you know, empirical magnitudes, what we are literally doing is estimating what is called a transition equation or a capital accumulation equation non-parametrically, and that is giving us the threshold. So we can empirically measure what is the critical value uh, below which uh, people are basically decumulating. Um, thank you very much. And, and there are a couple of other questions in the chat. Um, just in the interest of time, I'm going to move on to our next panelist, but we'll see if we can come back to some of these questions during the discussion. Um, thank you very much, Maitre. Uh, so I'm going to uh, Thanks for the questions. I'm going to give the floor to Cynthia um, for a study which is also looking at, I guess, um, you know, the importance of segmentation and, and, and targeting potentially on some of these uh, types of interventions, but looking at microfinance. Uh, so Cynthia, you have the floor. Okay, well, thank, thank you so much. Thank you to IPA for, for organizing this and you know, for giving, giving us all a chance to take, take part. This is, this is really um, this is a great, great forum and I'm, I'm excited to, to talk about my work. <clears throat> uh, this project is uh, titled Can Microfinance Unlock a Poverty Trap for Some Entrepreneurs? And this is joint work with Abhijit Banerjee and Esther Duflo of, of MIT and Emily Brezza of Harvard. So, um, you know, this, this uh, I can kind of uh, free ride off of some of the great discussion that Maitrish has already uh, uh, given on this topic. So this is uh, as, you know, as it is uh, the word poverty traps is in the title. So I just wanna be a little uh, more clear about what I mean uh, by, by a poverty trap. So, so here we have a, a picture that, you know, some of you who have maybe taken a, a development economics course, um, you know, uh, may, may recognize. So the idea of a poverty trap is, you know, in, in kind of econ parlance, is that it's a dynamic process with multiple steady states. What do I mean by a dynamic process? I mean that uh, how much, uh, let's say, assets, A sub T, how much assets you have today is going to affect your ability to generate assets for, for the future. Or to put that another way, it just means that where you start determines uh, where where you end up, and in particular, and you know this this is gonna again uh, look sort of uh, look look familiar in the context of some of what my treat has just been been discussing. Uh, there may be some critical threshold, which in this figure is going to be called a bar, such that if I start out uh, at or just above a bar, I can kind of grow my wealth uh, quickly uh, and and move up to a, a high steady state like a two. Whereas if I start even a little bit below a bar, uh, I might my assets instead are going to decline over time until I eventually end up at this 
that's lower steady state or what we might call a poverty trap at A, A1. So what one uh, very important implication of poverty traps is that a temporary shock to wealth or capital can push some households and, and their businesses uh, onto a path of permanently higher outcomes or you know, outcomes and, and, and incomes. You know, so for, so for instance, if someone is just a little bit below uh, a bar uh, and we give them either, uh, we give them a transfer of wealth or we give them the ability to, to borrow some, uh, some capital, then that may be enough to get them over that a bar threshold to where they could be on a permanently higher, uh, on a trajectory uh, to a kind of self-perpetuating higher level of income. Okay. So what I wanna talk about uh, today is the question of, you know, is there scope for microfinance to unlock a, po a poverty trap? So again, this 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 discussion is made made easier by by following uh, the discussion that, that Maitreesh just gave a, a few minutes ago. You know, what's why is there why do we why might we think that there's a kind of key interrelation between assets and poverty traps? Uh, as as Maitreesh mentioned, uh, assets are are lumpy. You can't buy half a sewing machine. You can't buy two thirds of a boat. You can't buy three quarters of a of a market stall. Those things. Um, you know, to be kind of functional and operational, you either you either own them in their entirety or or, or not at all. Uh, also, as as we know, and as 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 many many people are probably in, in this webinar are, are, are well aware, uh, saving up can be challenging. There's various problems, weak security, temptation, um, you know, the request for, to share assets with other members of communities and households, uh, other pressing needs, all of these things can deplete savings. And this can be especially true for poor households whose access to a formal savings account as kind of a safe and secure place to, to put their money uh, is, is limited. Okay. And so the combination of these two things that you, you kind of need money to earn money, you need to have this indivisible asset in order to, uh, to, to, uh, to, you know, to earn more money or to earn money at a faster rate can lead to uh, rich get richer, poor get poor dynamics where poor micro entrepreneurs use technologies that have low upfront costs, but that are inefficient. Well, wealthier entrepreneurs use technologies that are more efficient but have high, high upfront costs. So just as one uh, example, uh, you can imagine that the inefficient but cheap technology is sewing clothing by hand, uh, and then the, the more efficient technology is to buy a, a mechanized sewing machine that requires a significant upfront cost, but then allows me to turn uh, fabric into clothing much more efficiently. Okay, so, so again, we want to think here about whether microcredit can help a, an entrepreneur that's poor but talented move to a more efficient scale and experience business growth by basically uh, breaking that, that need to accumulate all of the money to, to, uh, to buy the asset and allowing households instead uh, to, to finance some of it through credit. And we're going to argue that the answer to that question is yes. Okay, so I just, you know, just to kind of set, set the context, although I want to go through this quickly and, you know, in the interest of time and also because um, Rebecca has already kind of alluded to some of this, you know, should, you know, wh where, where has the literature left us in thinking about whether microfinance might have the scope to unlock a poverty trap? So again, as, as, as Rebecca alluded to at the start of this webinar, um, the sort of first generation of RCTs, including work that, that, I, uh, that I and my co-authors participated, uh, did not find uh, smoking gun evidence for the average borrower that microfinance is going to kind of catalyze, uh, you know, a broad-based uh, uh, exit from, from poverty. So here we have uh, across the uh, six different settings um, that uh, whose results were, were published in a, an issue of the uh, AEJ Applied, uh, a summary of, of some of the findings. And so you can see that across, um, across many of these findings, you know, we, we find uh, increases in, uh, in, in business ownership and business assets. We find, we find increases in business assets in all the settings where this is <clears throat> measured. But if we look at uh, business profits, uh, in the short to medium term, only one of these six studies, uh, the Morocco El Amana study, found an increase in business profits, and none of none of the studies found significant increases in uh, in, in household uh, income. So all this to just to, to say and to, to acknowledge that at least the uh, the short-term evidence for average borrowers uh, did not uh, you know did not suggest that microfinance could lead to transformative growth for for the average borrower. I also want to mention one one thing, uh, which I think will be relevant, you know, both in the, uh, you know, uh, when we when we uh, when we talk about the asset based microfinance, and then kind of thinking about the uh, thinking about issues more broadly in, in the in the Q and A. Another finding that broadly emerges from uh, the first generation of RCTs is that the the demand for microcredit is is relatively modest. So if you look at the four studies here on the left hand side of the 
of, of this, uh, this histogram, uh, which indicate take up in settings where uh, microfinance is offered to a, re a representative population of eligible borrowers, you can see that across these settings, uh, borrowing from the um, from the implementing uh, microfinance organization was uh, never exceeded uh, one one third. So that's just another kind of uh, point I want to I want to put out there and, and something that, that we can return to later and thinking about how to make you know how to, how to help uh, households and micro entrepreneurs uh, you know kind of catalyze asset accumulation. Okay, so so we have those two you know somewhat uh, you know maybe so, somewhat uh, discouraging shall we shall we say uh, data points, but why should we nonetheless think that there could be the scope for microfinance to unlock a poverty trap for some households? So there's evidence uh, from a number of settings, uh, including uh, some meta analysis work by Rachel Meager that. Uh, that shows the that the impacts of microfinance can can be heterogeneous and that that can happen for for many reasons. So one just data point there is that in Hyderabad, the setting that I'm uh, going to be talking about uh, today, and I should probably speed up, uh, is that uh, just under half of microfinance borrowers only only just under half had any business at all, indicating that many households are borrowing for consumption and, and not for business growth. So that's kind of a first order. Um, Kind of uh, dimension of heterogeneity that suggests that that households, uh, some households are going to have different impacts than others. Also, and I'll talk about this if I have time. There's you know both theoretical and empirical reasons to think that micro finance may cause quote unquote weaker businesses to enter uh, businesses who uh, may not have been able to enter uh, entrepreneurship in the absence of access to credit and that can be another reason why uh, kind of if we look at the treatment group on on average as compared to the control group we may see uh, kind of attenuated impacts on business outcomes if the composition of who owns a business and the treated in the treatment group has has changed also and, and again uh, this is something that I that that my Trish, um, addressed very, very effectively, microfinance loans just might be too too small to pull some house, push or pull, uh, to, you know, choose your verb, uh, some entrepreneurs out of a poverty trap. If they're too far below that threshold uh, level that I, I labeled a bar in my slide, a micro loan may not be enough. Enough. Um, although, as I'll talk about uh, a little bit later, uh, we also want to, uh, it's going to be important to realize that microfinance doesn't exist in a, in a vacuum and that microloans may also help households uh, increase their borrowing from, from other sources, as I'll, as I'll come back to. And then finally, uh, we also might need to look at a, you know, look further out in time to see if there are uh, persistent impacts of microfinance. It might just take time uh, for the impacts of microfinance to really uh, manifest. Maybe households need time to learn to use that new and more efficient sewing machine, uh, you know, more, uh, you know, mo most effectively to really, re to really realize its, its benefits. Okay, so, you know, kind of pulling all of that together, I'm going to try to convince you, you know, that both, you know, a priori, this, this makes sense, and, and empirically, this is going to be exactly what we find, that investment-based poverty traps are going to be uh, most relevant or most likely for for a group that we're going to refer to as by the shorthand term of gung-ho entrepreneurs or GEs. And these are households who have kind of already demonstrated, uh, uh, you know, the, the, both the, you know, the, the willingness and the, um, the ability in some sense to operate a business uh, and, and who are therefore um, kind of on the cusp of, um, you know, catalyzing that, uh, that business, moving that business to a, to a higher level of, of income by, by acquiring assets. Our simple proxy for that is going to be, uh, did a given household enter entrepreneurship before microfinance was widely available? That is, at the time when our implementing partner in this setting came in and started offering microloans, did a particular household already have a business? And so when I refer to GEs or gung-ho entrepreneurs, I'm, I'm going to re be referring to households who meet that criteria. Okay, so let me uh, to, you know, tell me, tell you uh, more about what we do. We're going to analyze the long-run impacts of a randomized control trial that introduced microfinance to neighborhoods across Hyderabad in, in India. Uh, this the study uh, coincidentally started at a, a time not not so dissimilar to to when the the uh, the Bangladesh study that that Maitreesh talked about uh, study, uh, started. Uh, so in in 2005, the uh, MFI Spandana selected 104 neighborhoods in Hyderabad. Uh, 52 of those were randomized into control, and they received microfinance beginning in 2006. The uh, sorry treatment, I think I misspoke. The control households received microfinance starting in in 2008. This was what, you know kind of a, a holdback uh, design. Uh, then, for reasons I won't have time to get into now, but I'm happy to talk about uh, offline or in the Q&A, uh, in 2010, uh, throughout the state of Andhra Pradesh, to, of, of which uh, Hyderabad was, was then a, a part, uh, microfinance was completely shut down in, in that state. So what that means, oh, and then the final thing that I, I need 
me to tell you is that most of the data I'll show you uh, in, this, in this talk was follow-up data collected in 2012, about two years after that microfinance uh, ordinance. So we're basically going to be comparing treatment areas that had microfinance for four years prior to that uh, 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 prior to that uh, ordinance versus control areas that had microfinance for only two years prior to that ordinance. But I just want to emphasize that none of these areas have uh, have ha had microfinance in uh, in 2012. And so any effects we see in 2012 reflect persistent effects of past microfinance access, which then may kind of remind you of that idea from the poverty trap picture that if households are subject to these poverty trap dynamics, that a short term intervention can have persistent impacts. Okay, so let me just summarize because I may have to go through some of my slides uh, quickly. What do we find? We find that past additional access to microfinance, that is when we compare the control group uh, at relative, uh, we compare the treatment group relative to the control group, past additional access to microfinance had large effects, uh, but only for those gung-ho entrepreneurs, only for those who started their business before microfinance entered uh, Hyderabad. What do I mean by that? Uh, we see that throughout the distribution, and I'll explain on the next slide what I mean by that, kind of throughout the distribution uh, of, on, of investment levels, we see more investment in the treatment group than we do in the control group. We see uh, average impacts on profits, which, uh, which is a, a finding that we find uh, pretty, pretty exciting. Uh, uh, and that's, that's driven, um, you know, that, that's gonna be driven by the gung-ho entrepreneurs and, and particularly the top like third of the distribution for the gun entrepreneurs. We see that non-business durables increase. So households are, are also uh, able to kind of enjoy some consumption uh, benefits of, of this, this additional profits and, and income. And we also see that consumption increases for, the, for basically the middle 50% of, of, of the distribution. Then what do we see when we look at uh, the those who are not gung ho entrepreneurs. These are, uh, and I should clarify, this is either those who entered entrepreneurship later or not at all. For that group, we don't see positive or negative impacts. Microfinance seems to have a fairly precisely estimated uh, null or zero effect, not only on average but kind of across the distribution, as I'll show you. Uh, and then uh, finally, something that I won't have time to delve into in, in, in detail uh, now, but would be happy to talk more about in, in the in the Q and A, is that we find that. Uh, for these gung ho entrepreneurs being in the treatment group and therefore getting more microfinance significantly and substantially increases their their informal borrowing. So so they they respond to getting more formal borrowing from a microlender by kind of crowding in or increasing also their informal borrowing. And if I if I get a chance at the end, I'll kind of try to convince you that both of those pieces are important to understand how a relatively uh, small uh, small loan uh, is able to push um, uh, push a significant number of households out of a poverty trap. Okay, so let me uh, jump into these pictures. I'm going to show you several pictures that have the same structure. So let me just take a second here to kind of explain, uh, you know, what what I'm showing you here. So this is the, this uh, figure plots what are called quantile treatment effects, which just compare at a given po point in the distribution uh, that that percentile of the distribution in the treatment group versus that percentile in the control group. So for instance, uh, the, 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 the point here corresponding to the 50th percentile says, is the median level of business assets in the treatment group uh, higher than the median level of business assets in the control group? And then we've also plotted here 90% uh, confidence intervals to, to, uh, to, uh, to gauge whether those differences are statistically significant. So again, this is for the gung-ho entrepreneurs. And uh, kind of what you can see here by looking at when those error bars do and don't, um, you know, contain uh, zero essentially is that starting at about the forty, the fortieth percentile of the distribution, and then continuing uh, there thereafter up up the distribution, we see that there are are significantly more business assets among gung ho entrepreneurs in the treatment group than in the control group. So to put that another way, uh, because this was a randomized controlled trial, microfinance seems to be uh, causally and significantly increasing business assets for you know, roughly the top 60% of, of the distribution of gung ho entrepreneurs. Okay, so now what do we see for the non gung ho entrepreneurs? Well, as I kind of already um, you know, indicated to you what, what, to, what to expect, we basically see throughout the distribution, there's, there are no effects on business asset ownership for the non gung ho entrepreneurs, with the exception of this, uh, you know, large but relatively imprecisely estimated uh, kind of um, effect at the very top, which we interpret as kind of basically that this is misclassification. These are a few individuals who are relatively simple heuristic for who's a gung ho entrepreneur and who's not, you know, we've, we've sort of misclassified a few individuals. But setting that aside, there's no effects, positive or negative, on asset ownership for the gung ho entrepreneurs. 
Okay, so what do we see for business profits? So here's a distribution for gung-ho entrepreneurs. But, uh, again, as many of you on this call will know, uh, business profits are uh, you know, notoriously uh, difficult to, to observe and, and can be noisier than, uh, than, than other uh, uh, kind of indicators of, of business activity. But so here, basically, we, we see uh, increases in business profits for the, uh, for the top third of the distribution, roughly. And I haven't indicated this on the, on the uh, diagram, but this, this, this also drives a significant overall effect. We see nothing, uh, no positive or negative effect for the, for the non-gung-ho entrepreneurs. And then finally, I'll show you two more of these pictures. And then I know I'm just about out of time. Uh, what do we see for consumption? You know, kind of a measure of, of, of what this means for household, household welfare, household spending. So for the for the gung hos, as I as I told you, we see consumption uh, uh, in uh, you know significantly increasing, you know roughly from about the 25th percentile up to about the 80th percentile. Kind of suggestively, we see uh, possibly a negative effect at the top of the distribution, which we could interpret as. Uh, basically returns for those businesses being so high that those households are choosing to kind of continue to tighten their belts so that they can reinvest you know every uh, you know every every rupee of, of business profit back into their business and again for the non gung hose we see we don't see positive effects anywhere in the distribution and we also don't see any evidence of negative impacts we don't see the evidence that these non-gung households are are harmed uh, you know are experiencing long-term harm uh, by virtue of having uh, having access to microfinance in, in the past Okay, I think I'll I'll skip over these impacts over uh, over uh, over time, and I'll just uh, oh, and that's my timer telling me that I think I'm I'm out of I'm I'm, I'm out of time. Uh, that, yeah, that would be what. The, Please go go ahead and continue. Okay, all right, I'll I'll just I'll continue for just like one 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 more minute. Uh, so you know, so why why do these gung ho entrepreneurs experience these positive effects that that increase over over time? So you know, the, the last thing I'd like to I guess tell you. Is that I didn't, you know, I didn't show you this in a in a quantile treatment effect uh, plot, uh, but that the, these gung ho entrepreneurs respond to increased microfinance access by by increasing their informal borrowing. So if we if we ask households uh, about all the loans that they have from from informal sources, meaning not from a bank, not from a microfinance institution, uh, that they took for a business purpose, uh, these gung ho entrepreneurs increase their informal loans for business purposes by about twelve thousand rupees, uh, which is about seventy five percent. Uh, a 75% increase relative to the control mean, and that's highly uh, statistically significant. Uh, for the for the non gung ho entrepreneurs, we see no such pattern, and if anything, we see a decrease in informal borrowing for the non gung hos. So for the for the non gung ho uh, individuals, they seem to be actually slightly re reducing their their informal borrowing. Okay. So then I won't have time to tell you about this, but we take these different ingredients. Uh, the um, you know, we we use the the responses of of investment. Uh, and profits, as well as the uh, increases in formal and informal borrowing, we put those ingredients into a uh, into a structural estimation to estimate the production functions of the gung ho entrepreneurs. Put those in a dynamic model and 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 see whether the model can uh, reconcile the empirical effects that that we that we see. Um, and I guess the the thing I'll leave you with is that we we estimate a fixed cost uh, of of scaling up a business and moving to a more productive technology of about uh, eight thousand rupees, which is uh, which is close to the median level of baseline wealth, suggesting that about half of households in the sample don't have sufficient wealth uh, to kind of self-finance that uh, that fixed cost of, of moving into um, uh, moving into to self uh, to self uh, to, to a more productive method of, of self-employment. Uh, and for those households, the combination of microfinance plus the additional informal borrowing that it seems to unlock can move uh, can move about a quarter of households, those roughly from the median to the 75th percentile of the distribution, uh, out of the out of the poverty trap. Okay, so I will, um, yeah, I'll 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 stop I'll stop there and uh, look look forward to uh, taking questions either either now or or uh, in the Q and A. Thank you so much, Cynthia. Um, I, there's some really good questions in here. I think in the interest of time, if it's okay with you, um, I'm going to flag them for the discussion so we can move on to the last presentation. Um, so everyone who has this question, I see them. Um, we'll make sure that we get to them shortly. Um, so I'm just going to pass the baton now to Mohammed and, and Simon for our final presentation. Um, and I, I think one of the earlier questions about um, uh, credit versus just asset transfer um, kind of started to, to get at the topic of, of, of your study, um, but I'll hand it over to you now for asset-based microfinance for microenterprises. I think you're on mute then, Mohamed. 
Sorry. Thank you very much, Rebecca. Thank you, uh, Cynthia Mitrich and everyone at IPA, uh, Luciana and Cara for organizing and for funding this um, study on asset-based microfinance. So we're working in Pakistan and we're working with graduated borrowers from one of the largest microfinance institutions in the country. And we're helping them finance an asset that's worth a fixed asset for their business that's worth just under 2000 uh, US uh, dollars. We do this using an asset-based financing contract, which I'll describe in more detail, but just to flag that there are two types of contract that we implement, one with a more fixed repayment schedule and one with a more flexible repayment schedule. Now, who are these uh, clients? As I said, it, uh, we're working with one of the largest MFIs in Pakistan. This is uh, an MFI by the name of Akhwat. And these graduated borrowers are individuals who have previously taken a loan, at least one loan, and have reached the maximum amount of borrowing at the MFI. So that's just under 500 US dollars. They've expressed an interest in expanding their business by purchasing a fixed asset, and we allow them to purchase a fixed asset up to around uh, 2000 US dollars. So in, in, essentially, we're strongly backing these graduated borrowers by providing them an amount of financing that's almost four times greater than the amount that they previously had available to them. Who are these uh, individuals? Well. On average, they're about 37 years old and have been running a business for about eight years. Um, we have about 92% men, 8% female. Um, we have a follow-on project which builds on this, which targets uh, women specifically and just provides asset financing uh, for women. I can discuss that in the Q&A. So on average, these uh, micro enterprises have just one employee uh, and the median is actually uh, zero employees. And total fixed assets is around 900 US dollars uh, on average. And if you think back to what I just said about us financing up to $2,000 of an asset, this essentially triples the fixed asset stock for some of these micro enterprises, which is a large amount. Monthly revenue is around 700 US dollars and uh, business profits around 250 US dollars. So what's the contract that we use? Well, um, we use a contract based on local financial norms using a diminishing Musharaka structure. Essentially, this is a shared ownership declining balance contract, which would be familiar to many people um, in an Anglo-American law context. It's a higher purchase con contract. In some cases, it's called um, like a rent to own contract or a lease contract. So it's a contract that's very familiar, but we've tailored it to this uh, specific setting and I'm happy to talk more about that at the end. And as mentioned, we have two types of repayment schedule. We have a fixed repayment schedule and a flexible repayment schedule. Both contracts have a duration of 18 months. And in the fixed repayment contract, the, in, the client purchases 10% of the asset initially and the MFI purchases 90%. Over a period of 18 months, the client is required to purchase 5% of the asset every month and fully owns the asset at the end of the 18 month period. The flexible repayment contract only has half of the repayment requirement of the fixed repayment contract. So the client just has to purchase two and a half percent of the value of the asset, thereby owning 50% of the asset every month. However, they are able to purchase more of the asset in any given month if they choose to. And we do see many people choosing to do this. Now, in both contracts, we use the same sort of structure, which is that the MFI and the client jointly own the asset. And as I, as I said, it's, it's based on a shared ownership structure. Um, in technical terms, this would be a constant amortization contract rather than a constant repayment contract. So every month, there's a fixed repayment amount that the client has to make based on the ownership, but the rental amount will change based on who owns which proportion in each, in each period. So it's a constant amortization rather than a constant payment. This is a table which... Uh, illustrates an example of an asset that costs 1,000 US dollars. So as mentioned, the client initially purchases 10% and the MFI purchases 90%. And every month, the client is required to purchase 5% of the ownership share so that they own the asset completely at the end of the 18 months. And this is 50 US dollars in this particular case. And every month, there's also a rental payment based on the proportional ownership shares. So in the first, first month, the, the MFI owns 90% and so the rent is $9. And then that decreases over time as the client owns more of the asset. We also have a fixed re flexible repayment contract where they can purchase the, the asset quicker if they so choose to. So this flow diagram explains the design of the experiment. We had 750, approximately 750 micro enterprises, and we assign a third to a control group a third to the fixed contract and a third who are offered the flexible contract. Now the control group, we're not blocking them from getting financing or anything like this. They're, they're, they have available to them the, the same business as usual 
um, a loan of up to 500 US dollars, and it's actually zero interest. So it's relatively high bar against which we test our treatments. So then we have an offer of either a flexible or a fixed contract to uh, one third of, of the entrepreneurs. A third of them we offer the flex the fixed contract to, and we find that 53% of the individuals take up this contract, i.e. they pay the 10% deposit and they proceed through to purchasing of the asset. A third of the individuals we offer a flexible contract. However, we also give them the option of rejecting the flexible schedule and opting for a fixed schedule. And we find that 50% of the people who we offer the flexible contract to accept the flexible repayment schedule, and 9% say, actually, we'll take the fixed schedule. Uh, uh, rather than the flexible schedule. So overall, the, the take-up rate is 57%. Um, if you recall the, the graph that Cynthia showed you, this is relatively high compared to the average take-up in the microcredit literature. However, uh, you know, again, as Cynthia said, it's not necessarily a fair comparison because a lot of that literature is offering microfinance for the first time to, to a new population, whereas some is offering um, to graduated borrowers or to people who had already expressed an interest in microfinance, which is closer to our sample. Nonetheless, we, we do think that's a relatively high repayment rate. At the baseline, we see a big variety in the different sectors that people are operating, different sectors that businesses are operating. And this is also reflected in the variety of assets that people are purchasing with our financing contract. So we have around 280 people who end up with an asset. And this varies from rickshaws, sewing machines, food machines, cameras. And these are all high quality assets. The average value of assets is around 1500 to 1600 that's purchased. And this is very similar average for all of these different categories. So it's a very high quality sewing machine or a very high quality camera. The contracts perform well in practice. So we have relatively low default rates, around uh, less than 5% default rate. Essentially, the MFI gets its money back. On the left, we see the repayment data for the fixed repayment contract. The blue dotted line shows you the obligation for the client. So over a period of 18 months, the client is obligated to go from, an, from owning 10% of the asset to owning 100% of the asset. And that's represented by the blue dotted line. The bars underneath and the triangles and the circles show you the actual repayments or the spread of the actual repayments. And you see here that the repayments are, are actually pretty much in line. We have a small number of defaults, but essentially most people are repaying. The MFI is getting its money back and they're owning the asset at the end. On the right-hand side, we have the flexible repayment contract. The green dotted line shows you what I said before, that the repayment requirement is only half of the fixed repayment requirement, requiring them only to own 50% of the asset at the end. However, the, the, the bars above, you above it show you that the clients actually do end up paying much more than they need to. So at the 18-month stage, we actually have people owning 80% of the asset. Now, how do these contracts actually work in practice? Basically, we see big impacts on the assets, total assets of the business, net assets. Um, we see big impacts on profits and household consumption. This, this is a cumulative distribution function, which shows you that the effects are not just being driven by the, the top end of the distribution. So it's, it's similar kind of um, it's similar to what uh, Cynthia was trying to show with her results about uh, distributional effects. Here, we, here we're showing that it's basically a shift across the whole distribution. So the red is the is the treatment, and the blue is the control. And and assets are increasing for for a lot of uh, individuals in our sample. And um, this is the effect of being offered the, the the finance contract. And this translates into business profits. So we're increasing assets, and we're increasing. Uh, business profits across the whole distribution again. So assets in, in, increased by about 40% on average and uh, business profits increased by about 11% per month of business profits on average. This then translates into household level outcomes. Um, we see an increase in household income, total household income, and an increase in total household consumption expenditure, approximately 6% per month. And this is again across the whole distribution. So it's not just affecting the, the uh, one part of the distribution. What's driving this increase in household consumption expenditure? It's a number of different components. We see an increase in expenditure on food, but the biggest driver is really increase in expenditure on education, on schooling for their children. Um, approximately 25 or 26% increase compared to the control group. And this is primarily being driven, driven by increased expenditure on girls and a number of different components, spending on, on inputs, on books, on materials, on fees, on, on school, uh, food during school and, and clothing, etc. So we see these big impacts. Summarizing our results, over a 24-month period, uh, we find that this treatment being offered, this asset financing contract, 
significantly increases the likelihood that people stay in business. I haven't mentioned this before, but we basically find that uh, those who are offered the contract are nine percentage points more likely to be running a business um, over the two-year period. They have 40% greater uh, assets on average and 11% greater monthly profits. This then translates into greater total household income of 8% per month and greater household consumption expenditure, which is driven mainly by food expenditure and also a 25% increase in spending on children's education, uh, particularly that of girls. And now I hand over to Simon. Thanks, Mohammed, and, uh, and thanks again, everyone, for sticking with us. Um, I wanted to start by slightly misquoting the famous astronomer Arthur Eddington by saying, well, yes, this is great. This all works in practice, but does it work in theory? I just want to take five minutes to step you through in overview, a theoretical model, a structural model that we have in the paper to try to think about the underlying mechanism, the non-convexity that would justify or explain the results we have, and then to think more generally about the implications for that of that for asset-based financing. So in the model, we build and calibrate a dynamic structural model. We do this for several reasons. First, as Muhammad has mentioned, our results are unusual in the context of the microfinance literature. Second, we want to rationalize an entire chain of causation from capital shock to profits to household consumption. We also want to characterize dynamics in the way that we've heard from the two previous presenters uh, earlier. So in our model, which I'll present today just in words, we think about a credit constrained household making forward-looking investment and consumption decisions. That's to say on an infinite horizon, our household is gonna think about how much to hold in fixed assets and how much to hold in cash and how much to consume. So we allow this household to hold fixed capital, which is held in the micro enterprise productively and also cash. The return to cash or indeed, if you like any other liquid asset class is low. The return to fixed capital is high. However, we think about fixed capital as being lumpy. We follow some of the previous literature in capturing that lumpiness or non-convexity through a minimum transaction size we'll call that kappa. We calibrate our model through structural calibration to key features of our data, including to our estimated experimental effects. Now I'm going to explain the implications of the model using three graphs. And these graphs we can think of as policy functions, that's to say they tell us within the stylized model framework, what the model predicts using the calibrated parameters should be the behavior of the micro enterprise, depending on where it starts in the different, uh, if you like, state space. So we're gonna think on the x-axis about capital, or really meaning fixed capital within the firm. And then as we go back on, if you like the y-axis, we think about financial uh, capital, which is to say, if you like the cash uh, based asset. And then on the z-axis, we're going to think about the predicted change in capital. I think this is really interesting because it illustrates a point that's been made before, which is that the returns to fixed capital are high. That's consistent with previous literature and something that our model and our data also reflects. That's to say households would love to get into the fixed asset class if they can. But in order to be able to cross that threshold to buy a lumpy asset, they need to have quite an, a decent amount of cash on hand. Do they optimally decide to accumulate that cash in order to access that asset class? Well, the next slide shows the policy function for what households will optimally do with their cash account. And the answer is they do not optimally accumulate. They rationally spend down their cash because the returns to cash are very low. So this actually imitates in a very different context, some of the recent insights that we see in the heterogeneous agent New Keynesian macro modeling, where we talk about wealthy hand to mouth uh, behavior where you have a, a household that could be quite wealthy in terms of its fixed or illiquid capital stock, but yet at the same time choose optimally to hold very limited cash on hand. Now, what's the implication of that for microfinance contract design? Well, here we've got our uh, phase diagram. We've seen a few phase diagrams so far in this webinar. In our phase diagram, we have to think about a two dimensional state space. So depending on where you start in this fixed capital financial capital space, where do you choose to go in the next quarter? And the simple answer is that unless you're getting close to this critical line cap up, the answer is you go down. You choose not to adjust your fixed capital stock, but you spend down your cash either quickly or perhaps slightly more slowly over time. Only as you get close to this, this threshold cap up, are you able to invest or of course, if a microfinance product like ours shifts you horizontally, uh, that's to say increasing your fixed capital, do you then have what ends up being a very persistent increase in business and household wealth and welfare?
Now, what are the implications of this? We actually see this as plugging into several interesting areas of microfinance research. The first uh, related body of literature really speaks to microcredit evaluation. And uh, as we've mentioned before, this is uh, an area that has not on average showed transformational effects. And this would be consistent with a world in which most of these studies are giving relatively small sums of money, often with high interest rates. Related, it also speaks to microenterprise cash and capital grant literature, including, of course, the paper that Matrice presented earlier, where we do see high returns to capital, high returns to ultra poor graduation programs. What we have done here is to build on the results from cash based microfinance and asset transfer studies implementing an asset-based finance contract for graduated borrowers. I think this is particularly important in the wake of COVID-19, where there's growing interest in asset-based microfinance. And this really comes back to the question that Alexander posed at the beginning, which is how do we think about making these kind of financial or asset transfers viable while also recovering and redeploying the capital? What we show both empirically and through our structural model is that asset-based financial transfers are a way to do that. Thank you very much. Uh, I look forward to discussing in the Q&A. Wonderful. <clears throat> Thank you very much, both of you. Um, so I'm gonna enter into the last, um, I guess, 20, 25 minutes of, of the webinar. Thank you everyone for sticking with us to this point again. Um, if you do have questions again, please a reminder, put them into the Q&A box. Um, I'm going to start actually by going back to Cynthia because I know we had we had a couple of questions for you um, on your presentation that we didn't get a chance to address and some were um, there were a couple that are on the same theme so around uh, the increase in informal borrowing by gung-ho entrepreneurs um, what were some of the drivers of informal borrowing and then did we think that um, the MFIs were not um, uh, I guess don't have the right uh, loan amounts or amount of capital for those types of entrepreneurs? Should they be raising their borrowing limits? Um, what are the implications there? Okay, yeah, so so those are those are great questions. I, I, I think to the to the first part of the question uh, about kind of what's what's driving this, you know, this crowd in effect. I mean, this this is something that we're kind of um, thinking more about in, in ongoing work, but I think one way to to think about one way to think about this is is a kind of junior debt, senior debt kind of story. So that is, if um, you know, if 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 I'm if you know if I have two uh, sources that I can get financing from, and you know, one is one is a micro lender, and one is um, you know, let's say my um, you know one of my suppliers or purchasers who might give me trade credit. Uh, that second source, which we would classify as a source of informal credit, because it's not coming from a you know from a bank or an MFI, um, you know, if they see the micro loan as a um, you know, as a, as a product where if push comes to shove, um, you know, there may be through the joint liability structure, there could be some kind of, you know, ability to, um, have flexibility there to make sure that the, that the trade credit loan gets repaid, then that can be kind of one way that microcredit can help to crowd in these other sources of, of financing by basically saying, look, I have this other credit line. So if something goes a little bit off the rails, I'm not going to immediately default on my, my trade, my trade credit loan there. I think there can also just be kind of a signaling, um, uh, you know, kind of like a, a signaling effect or, you know, kind of to think about the type, the types of diagrams that, that, uh, that Muhammad and, and Simon just, um, just showed, you know, I mean, not, not, not to say that people walk around with those, um, you know, like three-dimensional phase diagrams in their, in their head, but I think there can be, you know, a, a sense of, okay, you know, I, I, I can only borrow 8,000 rupees from, uh, you know, from, from source A, and I can only borrow, let's say, 10,000 rupees from source B, and maybe neither of those by themselves is enough to get me the efficient sewing machine that I need, but I, you know, if I, if I, if I kind of have those two in combination, then it makes sense to, to take out both of those sources of, of credit. Um, I think to the second part of this, and very very quickly, um, you know, the, the shorter answer to the to the question of you know are these loan sizes kind of wrong? I think the shorter answer is is yes. I, you know, uh, uh, one of the things that we one of our goals in calibrating our in estimating the structural model that we do is to is to be able to say okay, you know, how how might you know aggregate output be different if if instead of giving a one size fits all loan to every borrower, if micro if micro lenders were to instead um, offer a portfolio of loans, let's say you know larger but perhaps somewhat higher interest loans uh, that would kind of self select the gung ho entrepreneurs versus um, smaller and maybe somewhat lower interest loans more targeted to consumption borrowing or financing small amounts of working capital. Um, 
you know, through the through the lens of our model, that would be productivity enhancing because these gung ho entrepreneurs could, you know, they they could, um, you know, scale up these profitable businesses even even more. I think something that uh, that you know the the next generation of research. Um, uh, is you know is starting to think about it. I'll be excited to see where this goes as to how to balance that you know these these forces that say you know more customization and more tailoring are good. You know how how can that coexist with the very real benefits that standardization brings in terms of keeping costs low, making making these products uh, you know transparent and also more kind of amenable to a, to a group structure, which seems to bring real benefits in terms of social capital. So so thanks. Yeah, thank you. And I, I think that brings me to, you know, another question that I had for the, the whole group, because the lesson here seems to be around targeting and, you know, finding the right fit for the right type of beneficiary. But Cynthia, like you just said, um, that becomes complicated very quickly for, for you know, an MFI or a, an NGO to, to um, actually carry out effectively. So I guess for the, the whole panel, uh, I mean, re what recommendations can we take from this work on how to target um, and who gets excluded uh, from this type of targeting and kind of what kind of trade-offs should, should policymakers and practitioners be thinking about? Simon, go ahead. I well, I could go, I could go have a go first and people can just certainly disagree with me. I mean, I think if you say to an applied econometrician uh, targeting, they'll immediately start thinking of machine learning and all sorts of weird and wonderful uh, techniques, which sometimes can be very useful. But I wanted to start by putting in a case for are simple transparent targeting rules which build on the experience of the MFI. So for example, in our case, we're looking at borrowers who have reached their borrowing limit, who are interested in, have expressed interest in purchasing a large fixed asset and who are well known to the microfinance institution. Now, I am sure that with a large number of covariates uh, and a machine learning technique that you could do a bit better than that, but I think that's a really good place to start. And I suspect that as a practical policy matter, then those kind of really simple rules of thumb is probably a great way to start um, with these kind of, this, this sort of class of microfinance contract. I don't know how, how others feel. Just, yeah, I mean, just agree with Simon. And I think there's, that also comes through with Cynthia's paper, right? Because these are individuals who already had a business. They'd already invested in the business. They already showed some sort of commitment to the business, right? So it's kind of like a, a, a softer form of targeting. Uh, I mean, there, and since Cynthia raises an interesting question about if we're moving, if we were to move away from um, joint liability, as many institutions have, how do we still kind of leverage the social capital? Um, and there's potential to use kind of digital uh, methods that are right to, to help customize products in, in a way that um, isn't as costly. But just wanted to flag that there's also interesting work on using like community based identification of high potential entrepreneurs. Um, there's a paper by uh, uh, Hussam Rogol and Roth, which is a very interesting way of, of still leveraging some sort of community information um, for targeting. So I'm going to go a bit against the grain of what we, uh, what uh, Simon and Mohammed said. Um, you know, clearly some amount of targeting is needed, and 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 it, it's sort of just practicality considerations point to that direction. But my general thrust is to have as much universal type programs that are clearly, you know, um, uh, sort of uh, open to whoever satisfies some broad criteria, uh, because otherwise, essentially, uh, this is, uh, of course, related to the broad discussion about universal basic income type, you know, arguments, but applying in this context, the discretion involved with those who will be implementing the programs, you know, of course, we can, I, I guess what I have in mind is mainly the sort of, you know, uh, the kind of Hayek like planning the planners fallacy type thing that we can be program evaluators, we can be NGOs doing lots of things, we can have fancy techniques, we can do all sorts of things. But left to their own devices, you know, uh, there's a certain ecosystem out there. So relatively light touch things with certain robust and broad criteria. My instinctive um, sort of, you know, uh, feeling is for programs like this. And let me just make one comment and I'll, I'll of course, want to hear um, 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 other thoughts on this. So when I was talking to Mr. Chandrasekhar Ghosh, who is the founder director of Bandhan Bank in, in India, which is a very famous MFI and Abhijit and Esther have worked with them. And in fact, that's how I met Mr. Ghosh um, uh, through Abhijit. 
So one of the questions I asked him is, why do they have this fixed microfinance product? So it's very rigid, it's very fixed, and it just applies to everywhere. And clearly all my intuition, economic thinking would say that it should be tailored, it should be varied. He said, I don't want to give the loan officers that discretion because then there will be arguments for favoritism, you know, all kinds of things, etc. So once again, this is of course a concrete illustration of it. And I do, you know, I'm not going to take a fundamentalist position here. You know, sometimes you know, some amount of targeting may be necessary, but this is just to point a bit of a force in the other direction. Just to add one thing, there was a question, sorry, it's Cynthia, I know you want to speak, just um, the, you, Rebecca, you had a question about who gets excluded. Just to be clear, in our case, I guess a group that we've excluded are people who didn't have a fixed asset that they wanted to purchase, right? I mean, we did have a number of individuals who came to us and said um, we wanted to fin finance working capital. Um, and they just, we, we, we told them, sorry, this is a project about fixed assets, right? So that, that's a group that um, have been excluded from our particular study and um, in, innovative kind of working capital financing models could be important. But sorry, I think I interrupted, Cynthia. Oh, no, 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 I, um, no, I, I was just gonna, I guess, just, you know, very, very, <clears throat> uh, very briefly kind of um, uh, echo what, what Maitrish mentioned and, um, you know, there's, there's been some interesting work um, uh, by, um, uh, by, by Dilip Mukherjee and, and, and his co-authors looking at kind of, you know, different, different intermediation models. Uh, Diego uh, Veracosio also has some interesting work looking at kind of on lending and kind of who, who um, you know, how, how credit gets uh, channeled through, uh, through on lending. You know, so I, I guess all of this to say that I, I think another, you know, interesting area where you know there's been some very interesting work happening and 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 as always more more work is needed is yes yeah, is to understand you know how how loan officer discretion would um you know would 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 play out um you know if 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 and as lenders do do move away from from more more uniform types of types of lending contracts thank you everyone um, another question that came in at the end of Cynthia's presentation, but I'd, I'd like to actually pose to the entire group. Um, so the discussion of findings seem focused on increasing incomes and consumption, which is obviously important. Um, this person's asking about other out outcomes that should also be assessed. So things like resilience, um, self feelings of, of self-efficacy or empowerment, um, diversification of revenue, things like that. Um, do we think that that income and consumption are too narrow a lens through which to, to look at the, the results of, of these interventions? Or you know, what would your response be to thinking about some of these other things like empowerment and self-efficacy as outcomes? Were those things that you guys, that you all measured and, um, as part of this work that maybe didn't come across? Um, I'll, I'll, I guess I'll, I'll start. Um, I, I think, I think this is, this is a, this is a great question. I, I think in, I mean, I, I think in, in part, like, okay, okay, I guess, I guess two thoughts, you know, I, I, think, I think, I think in part the, the literature has been kind of try, first trying to figure out how to move the needle on the things that, you know, that we think are, you know, these kind of, um, maybe not necessary, you know, maybe not necessary, but, you know, the, you know, kind of thinking, okay, first let's, let's figure out how, you know, you know, for whom and what kind of microfinance might move the needle on things like profits and expenditure. And I think, you know, I think now, you know, um, uh, you know, I, I think, I think all of the, the studies presented today have, have shown, you know, ways that, you know, modification of, you know, the kind of standard microfinance as asset, you know, as, as liquidity delivery model can, you know, move those needles of income and consumption. And that kind of, you know, now can free up uh, intellectual bandwidth to, you know, to, to maybe think in a more nuanced way about these other outcomes. Um, I mean, another, I, I will mention that um, as, you know, as, as many people on this, uh, in this webinar are probably aware, um, many of the, uh, the first generation microfinance uh, RCTs looked for and, and broadly did not find effects of microfinance on, for instance, female empowerment, with, with an exception being the, um, uh, the, the study in, in Mexico by, uh, by Angelucci, Carla, and Zinman, which did, did find some evidence of increases in kind of female decision-making uh, power in, in, in that study. Um, um, 
you know, yeah, but I, but I guess I'll also say that, you know, I guess, I guess my feeling is now, you know, as, as we're gaining more, more insight onto how to move the needle on things like profits and, and income and consumption, that now that can, you know, that can maybe be a, be a springboard to, to thinking more, more deeply about, about other outcomes. Um, yeah, just want to add, I think uh, Simon briefly mentioned that CGAP is doing great work at the moment in terms of thinking about asset-based financing. Um, and they make a distinction there between income generating or productive assets, which are income generating assets and more quality of life assets. So I guess most of what we've been talking about here are more in the space of like productive or income generating assets, but there is this whole uh, scope for quality of life assets. Um, in, in our study, um, we found that there was maybe some sort of like income diversification that comes through giving people an asset. Like generally we saw that the asset mapped onto the sector that people were originally working in. But sometimes people were taking an asset that would allow them to partially like, diversify their activities. So maybe taking a transportation asset, which would allow them to deliver food rather than just produce food or uh, deliver garments rather than just uh, produce garments. So we see a little bit of diversification that comes through um, the asset that we, that we give. Thank you very much. Um, this is another one for all the panelists, and um, it's referring to the first generation of, of microfinance studies, uh, which generally found null effects on profits and household income. So I guess, why do, why do we think that this next generation of work is showing much stronger effects? Is it the question of, of, of looking at, um, at different segments and, and looking at those heterogeneous outcomes versus average treatment effects? But can, can you all speak a little bit to you know, kind of big picture, how does this compare and, you know, how do we understand these results in the context of that first generation? Simon, go ahead. Oh, I can lead off if, if, if. <laughs> thanks so much, Laura. I, I learned so much uh, working with, with colleagues um, recently drafting the VoxDev lit piece that Rebecca referred to earlier. Um, others may disagree, but to me, as a rule of thumb, it's really about two things. One is a more nuanced approach to the client pool, and I won't repeat what we've just been talking about, but I think that's crucially important. And second is a more nuanced approach to product design. Um, in other words, put bluntly, a kind of courses for horses approach that rather than trying to think about one size fits all, which is supposed to be transformative, that we think about microfinance as trying to achieve different things for different kinds of client, and then trying to tailor that product within the relevant context. And let me let me let me grab again Rebecca's uh, offer at the beginning to to plug that box dev lit piece. Hopefully it is useful in providing an, an, an overview. But I really appreciate you raising that question because to me it was one of the things that I spent a lot of time thinking about when we drafted that summary. I guess just one one thing I would I would add, you know, I com I completely agree with uh, with with what with what Simon has has said. I I, I think just one one other piece of of this, um, at least some, you know, is is that um, uh, so sorry. One one figure I kind of blasted past in my in my presentation is that if uh, in our in the Hyderabad setting we can estimate treatment effects at three different points in time, a kind of um, a roughly fifteen to eighteen month treatment effect, a roughly three year treatment effect, and then a um, uh, treatment effect that's about six years after the intervention and two years after everyone lost access to microcredit. And um, I don't want to overclaim here because statistical precision is limited, but if you uh, if you look at the point estimates, it looks like the, the point estimates are, are growing over time. And I think that suggests that, um, you know, especially for these entrepreneurs who are, um, uh, who are, um, you know, acquiring a new asset, maybe moving to a different and more efficient mode of mode of production that, you know, that that may take some time to, to manifest. It also may take time, you know, in our setting, it's, you know, um, gathering together the informal credit that, that then gets kind of combined with the microfinance credit, you know, that that may also uh, take take some time as, as well. So I think, I mean, you know, again, I completely agree with with what Simon said. And I, I think one one other piece of it may, may be that, um, you know, when feasible, and this is not always feasible for various reasons, um, you know that that um, looking at looking at treatment effects out at a slightly longer time horizon can can also be a, a, a piece of the the explanation. So I just want to make a quick remark, and I'm uh, on board with uh, uh, both what Simon and, and Cynthia said on this. 
I think that we, we should keep in mind that the role of finance in general is of course to facilitate accumulation in the way that we have been studying and some of this long-term studies you know, are, are kind of getting at. But we also need finance to smooth consumption and income. And that's a different purpose altogether, right? So as I, I, I think whenever you know, I was uh, maybe in this group, which is just my sheer age of my, uh, my, myself, but I started working on microfinance in the late 90s. At that time, it was still hot. And then suddenly came a swing uh, that microfinance, a lot of you know, issues came up and it, 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 so people started looking for the next magic bullet. So uh, the thing though is that I always felt, imagine getting uh, say a credit card that's just gives you $100 or $50. It's a very, very limited amount. You cannot expect and you know, modular of course, what Cynthia's important study finds that those who had an existing business, et cetera. So I'm leaving that aside, but the smoothing value it might have could be quite important. And indeed there's been some early studies and in fact, maybe, you know, uh, I, I, I would love to know what is a much more recent study compared to the work of say Jonathan Modder, et cetera, in, in the earlier generation. But anyway, that's a point I just wanted to throw, uh, throw on the table. Thank you very much. Um, another question for the, the group. Um, so I think, you know, aid, uh, and, and, and our thinking about development um, is, is changing in light of, of, of the global pandemic and in the light of COVID. And you know, we're confronted with the new poor um, folks who might have just fallen um, into poverty as a result of the pandemic. And you know, governments are turning to cash transfers and other um, types of programming um, as a safety net. Um, what, what lessons can we take from this research uh, for, for governments and, and, and other practitioners on how, uh, how to address the, the post-COVID or um, this COVID reality that we all face? Um, you know, are there any recommendations here? I can just to step in and just throw in the problem here, but I don't know the solution to that. One of the things that I've been reading a lot, especially in the context of India and engaging with some of the policy uh, uh, debates there and discussions, indebtedness is sharply on the rise. So one of the massive implications of this COVID crisis is in expanding uh, wealth and income inequality because in some ways uh, among the poor, there's actually negative asset accumulation during this period because of the indebtedness and the disruption to economic activity. And I would be absolutely, you know, I, I think I can see the problems. I don't see the solutions, obviously, the, the MFIs are facing, you know, the scale of the problem, but it is a very serious issue in terms of how, how do we, you know, uh, address the liquidity needs of the very poor whose jobs and livelihoods are badly affected, right? And yet keep in mind the debt trap problem. So. And if others have any thoughts, Mohammed? Um, so just um, shameless pitch, but um, Sami and I, uh, we have a few projects where we're trying to work on models that not saying necessarily address the debt trap problem, they try to provide financing where the repayments are better linked to the performance of the micro enterprise. So equity based models using digital technology, cases where we think there's great observability of the performance of the business. Again, in a slightly uh, nuanced settings of where we know somebody has a, a productive business, a productive activity, um, but trying to provide more innovative kind of equity like uh, models. Um, but yeah, I agree with what's being said. Thank you all. Um, and if there are no other comments, I'm going to close it here. Um, thank you, everyone, again, for your attention. Um, and thank you to our fantastic panelists for, for sharing your work. Um, we will be following up with uh, links to papers, presentations, um, the Vox Dev uh, Lit Review that we've been mentioning. Um, and I think, um, you know, feel free to reach out to IPA or any of the panelists with more specific questions or follow up. We're happy to engage. Um, so again, thank you again. Thank you to our panelists. Thanks, um, Luciana and Kara from IPA for making this happen. And thank you for joining us. Have a great rest of your day or evening.